Y'all ready to get down? Y'all ready? I need you to preach with me today, okay? We are going to go into John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Easy breezy. John chapter, get in the right book here. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much because you have something for us day in and day out. God, we come with ready hearts, with ready ears to hear what you have for us. God, empty me completely of me because I don't have anything good to say, but God, speak through me that you would edify your body. We ask that your Holy Spirit would rain down, that your Holy Spirit would come and speak through me and also be be speaking into the ears of each one who is here that we would receive what you want us to receive in this time. We command that all of the plans of the enemy would be failed in the name of Jesus in this space, but we will receive from you. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Y'all, it is flu season. We're not high-fiving. Elbows. Throw a couple elbows to the friends around you. Save your germs and go ahead and have a seat. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure about y'all, but we're in February, and that was a long 72 days of January. Am I right or am I right? That was long January. We are in February. I'm excited about February. You know what February means? Oh, thank you very much for playing along. (laughs) The men out there, you're probably thinking, well, it's Super Bowl month, right? Um, Well, you're welcome. It's also Valentine's. You've got 10 days. (laughs) Get that figured out. Some of the husbands are kind of looking at their their wives saying, babe, I got this. I I know, I know, I know. My husband, you're welcome. You've got 10 days left. (laughs) Um, there might be some of our single friends in here who are, who are just wondering, what are the chances of a guy like you and a girl like her ending up together? One in a million. <laughs> but there's a chance. <laughs> um, I love Valentine's Day for the fact, um, I, I remember my mom when we were young that, you know, she didn't do anything extra spectacular. We never had like decorations and stuff, which like good, because ain't nobody got time for that. But we would come out um, and we would have little treats on the table in the morning, like just little fun stuff. And it was just a nice little reminder that we were loved and that we were thought of. Um, I really enjoyed as a kid going to school and getting to exchange our Valentines. You know, you spend the night before Back in that time, you know, we just had those cardboard things and you rip them apart and you write your name on it. And then you go into the classroom and you would put them in the little paper bags. Any paper bag folks out there, right? Thank you. Why are we having to make these boxes nowadays? Dear baby Jesus. Like, I am not a box making kind of person. I like the paper bags, but they've evolved into boxes now. So a couple years ago, my son had to, he um, was in first grade at the time, and so he had to make a Valentine's card box, but we had to use, we had to make it out of using hearts. And so we had to somehow make a box that looked like a dog made out of hearts. Good Lord. I lo- I'm the kind of mom, I really try hard to let them like, you got this, you can do it. You know, this is a part of learning. You're gonna do great. You can, you know, cut out the hearts. But really I'm like, oh, it's bedtime. I need him to go to bed so I can do it properly. Because <laughs> those lines aren't getting cut well. <laughs> um, I feel like I hit the parenting jackpot when in second grade, he still had his box from first grade tucked away in his corner. And um, when it was time to go to Valentine's Day, we used last year's box. Can I get a hallelujah? So good, so good. Um, Unfortunately or fortunately, this year, we have to make a robot to put Valentine's in. Whew, okay, okay. So you can pray for me about that. When I think of love, when I think of the word love, I actually think um, about this verse in the Bible because there's something that is so... um, It just keeps rattling around in my brain about this verse. Can we read it again? Would you guys permit me to do that? When we go back to this, it says, a new command I give you that you love one another. And as I have have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. That really kind of hits me and strikes me because I'm like, hmm, the way we love each other, that's how people in the world are going to see the followers of Jesus. 
It doesn't say how well you speak. It doesn't say all the things you know. It doesn't say how you can convince somebody that they're wrong in the comment section of your social media. I know y'all are trolling it. I am too. It's fine. I'm like, whoo, Lord, we can really do some work in those comment sections, can't we? But how we love one another, people are going to know Jesus. The way we behave in this world, people are going to understand who Jesus is. So my behaviors towards my brother or sister in Christ and my behaviors towards other people around me matter. So are our behaviors reflecting the love that Jesus has for us, and the, the love that he has shown, or are our behaviors reflecting a divisive, a jealous, a um, bickering community? I, I have to be convicted of that from time to time. Is what I'm saying and what I'm doing honoring the Jesus that I know? There's this really awesome lady that I've come into contact with, and she has this incredible ability to take two individuals from any kind of background, and instead of finding all the ways that they're different and their political views and the way they do different things and their opinions, and she finds a way that they are alike, and she capitalizes on that. I'm like, wow, that's a really cool thing. She has a way of sharing love with people. Now, when we look at the word love, in um, English, it could be a little bit confusing, right? Because there's a lot of different kinds of love. There's a lot of different ways of love. Like I love my mom. I've been fortunate enough to have a really healthy um, home environment. My, I know my mom loves me. I love my spouse. He's a solid dude. He's pretty handsome too, just saying. Uh, I love my spouse. I love my children. I also love warm weather. I like tank tops and flip flops. I love earrings. I love comfortable shoes because this is 40, right? <laughs> um, but love in the English language, we have one word, but it has a whole bunch of different meanings. Now, I understand because in the, in the country that we um, live and minister in, it is, it's colonized by the French, and so French is the national language, and so we speak French there. And sometimes when we're trying to talk about a situation or talk about something that's happened, we might be starting to look for a vocabulary word. We're like, what? What does it mean, what does this mean in English? And you're like, mm. it really just doesn't translate. Like there's not a good word to use for that. And likewise, in English, we might have a concept and we're trying to find it in another language. In our particular village that we work in, there are two different local language groups. And so um, my daughter speaks both of those as well as French, as well as English. She a little smarty pants, huh? So sometimes she'll be talking in the local language with some of the other kids, and I'll ask, like, what is, what is it you're talking about? What, is your, what are you saying? And she'll be reflecting, and she's like, Ugh. I mean, there really aren't any words for it. Like, it just doesn't translate well for you to understand what I'm meaning. I really think that she does not want me to know the local language, so they've got their <laughs> secret language, right? Um, but the reality is it is hard to translate things at times. So when we look at this word love, when Jesus says to love like I have loved you, the word in Hebrew that is actually found here is the word ahava. See, in biblical language, we will find different words that we only translate as love in English. But this ahava love is a Hebrew word to say something more than just what we see as love. The Greek used the word agape. And there are about seven or eight different words and four that are common for love in the New Testament and agape being one of those. But this ahava or this agape love, it means something a little bit different. What it means is this is the kind of love that sacrifices for somebody else. This is a love that at its deepest root and meaning, it says, I am taking care of someone. I am looking out for their needs. I am looking out for their well-being at the sacrifice of myself. This kind of love is the love that says, I put you before me. You are more important. What is it that you need? And I want to meet that. This is an interesting concept. It's not about how I feel. It's about 
what I do towards somebody. Now, the disciples, when Jesus was telling this to his disciples, they in fact probably weren't going to a dictionary to try and define what love was, and they weren't probably doing a word study. That's the kind of stuff that I totally geek out about. But um, what they did when he said, love like I have loved you, they only had to recall and look at Jesus. What did he do? How did he love me? They had experiences with Jesus. He was someone who was always showing up when there was a need to be had. He was caring about the physical needs of people. He fed people when they were hungry. He forgave people when they needed forgiveness. He served people. There was a particular time where Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples and they're like, whoa, 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 you can't be doing this. What are you doing? Like, you are, you're not a servant, you're our, you're our leader. You can't be washing our feet. And he says, no, I'm not better than anybody else. I can do the work of a servant. It is important for me to do that. Now, y'all, their feet were nasty. Might be like your winter feet, you know what I'm saying? They were walking around in sandals and the red dirt where it's hot and, you, you know, foot sweat mixed with dirt equals yuck. He, they had nasty feet, but Jesus got down and he kneeled before them and he cleansed them. He washed their feet. He, he was a servant. That's who he was. He was meeting a need that they had to be clean. He's not above anybody else. He was saying, do like this. There was a time in my life, this was early on when we moved to Benin within the first couple of years, and I um, had my first time of getting malaria. Now, um, it was kind of a doozy, I'm not gonna lie. And it became a little bit more complicated because um, not only did the tests not come back that I had malaria, and so I, I had this disease, but, this disease, but it was continually to get worse because it was not properly diagnosed, so I wasn't being treated for this, okay? Uh, but the other thing that was really problematic at the time was that my husband wasn't there. He was back in the States doing really important things. He was hunting. <laughs> yeah, if you're one of those, then you get it, and that's fine. Um, but the problem was, before he could get back to me, because of where we lived being a more rural area, it would take him four days before he could get there from the time I went into the hospital, because flights didn't come every day. You're going to be on the, flight, on the plane for more than 30 hours. He couldn't get to me quickly. And because we had been recently there, we didn't have people. We didn't have like, you know, friends or other Americans or other expats or whatnot who could help us out. So what happened was some of the kids from the orphanage, they went and found a chauffeur who could drive my vehicle to get me to the hospital that was two hours away in the main city. They picked me up, they put me in the car, and we made the journey down there. But what also is a bit problematic is because when you get there, the medical staff will only do medical work. They will administer the medication, they will put the IVs in, and they will do the medical stuff. But when it comes to eating, you're on your own. When it comes to you know, getting up and going to the bathroom, somebody has to help you do that. Anything, if you need sheets for your bed, then you have to bring them. Everything is up to those who are around you, and I found myself alone. But here's what Jesus does. He has helped me to see that he never leaves me alone. The night that I had dropped my husband off at the airport for him to go back for his very important business, then he, uh, I met this gal and she happened to work at the United States Embassy. And because um, my mom had called the embassy when I was sick and I'm in the hospital, I really don't have any other resources, she called there and this girl caught wind of it. She's like, oh, hey, I met that girl. She came to the hospital to visit me. She showed up. And when she showed up at the hospital to visit me, she said, what do you need? And I said, well, honestly, it's been three days. I need a shower. I just need a bath. Well, this very important individual in her high heels and her suit, she rolled up her sleeves and she took her bracelet off. She picked me up with somebody else. They took me into the shower. They sat me down on a chair and she washed me from head to toe. That lady was not Jesus, but boy, was she Jesus to me. And the Lord reminded me, I will never leave you alone. I saw Jesus and I understood the love of Jesus through the act that she did of washing me. That looked an awful lot like Jesus. I learned more about him and his love for me 
through that act. You see, when we love like Jesus, this is a powerful love. It's a transforming power because good people can do good things. But there is no goodness that can hold a candle to the power and the love of Jesus Christ. This love of Jesus, when we love like Jesus does, it is so radical. What Jesus did for us is so radical that it not only draws in people who don't know him and so they can see, oh wow, this is what this guy is all about. I wanna know more of that. It draws people into Jesus, but also fortifies those of us who are in the body of Christ to be reminded that we are not alone, that this world is hard, but we will lift and hold each other up. The way we behave matters. What we do, the actions we take matter. Is there somebody in your life that maybe you need to serve? Is there somebody in your life that has a need that maybe you need to meet? There was a poster on uh, an eighth grade math class. Obviously it was a little bit impressionable because here we are just a few years later and I remembered it said, if you see a need, meet it. That's the Jesus I know. He never saw a need and didn't meet it. Just like this lady who, you know what? I have never seen her since that day. And I would bet you that she does not remember who I am. She was just living out of the love of Christ in her, but I will never forget till the day I go on home to glory, I will never forget this lady and the way she loved me. Because when we love like Jesus does, it leaves an imprint that we just can't, we can't forget. Jesus meets our needs. People can meet the needs in order to be loved in a tangible way. What is a need of somebody around you that you have the capacity to meet? Would you love them like Jesus did? Would you love and meet that need? Not because you're good or they're good, but because Jesus asked us to do that. In this scripture, it says, a new command I give you. A new command I give you to love one another. Now, listen, I thought that I've been hearing Jesus talking about loving each other for a long time. There's the old golden rule. You guys know it, right? The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I thought that that was something that the schools created. Turns out Jesus coined that one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That goes back to uh, the Old Testament where it talks about the greatest, the, the commands that God gives us. The first one is to love God and the second one is to love others. We see people, we see the religious leaders questioning Jesus about this back in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 37. They question, what, teacher, which is the greatest command? And Jesus replies this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and... The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two things. He says, what is most important is love God and love others. You can't have one without the other. You can't love God and not love others. When you're loving others, you're loving God. It's two sides of the same coin. So what's new about this? Well, see in the Old Testament times, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because in that time, self was the highest standard. That was the highest elevation. Is certainly people care enough about themselves and their own well-being. So care about the well-being of somebody else like you would yourself. Well, there's some of you out there who are saying, well, I don't really like myself, so I guess I don't have to treat my neighbor very good either. Some of us have a hard time loving others because we don't even love ourselves very well. Well, what's new about this? What's new about this is it no longer is self the standard of love. Jesus is the standard of love. He doesn't say love others as yourself. He says love others the way I have loved you. Love others the way I have loved you. This is the new standard. This is a powerful change. This is a powerful way to love. First day, first time I go to Benin on my very first trip, I really kind of wasn't really sure why I was there, what I was even supposed to be doing. I just really felt like God had told me 
to go. And so I'm there and I, I was talking to the Lord one day and I said, well, Lord, just help me to see things the way you do. Help me to see the people here through your eyes. God, help me to love them the way you love them. Oh my Lord, what a dangerous prayer. Had I known how dangerous that prayer would have been, I maybe wouldn't have prayed it because it absolutely rocked my world. I was able to see things differently. I had a compassion, almost like a power and a passion inside of me to meet the needs that I was seeing in front of me, not because of who I was, because of who God was in me. I was seeing things the way he did. And when we can do that, we are changed as well. I wanted nothing more than to meet the needs of those who were before me. I also had an incredible experience. I'll never forget it. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I was sitting on a porch with these square tiles that were filthy dirty, and next to me was a a metal fence that was made out of, uh, it was painted red, made out of metal, and it was completely rusty. I I can see where I was, and I was playing with this little girl, and out of nowhere, I thought, I had this aha moment, this ahava love moment. I thought, oh. This is how my mom feels about me. For the first time, I understood the love of a mother as I was holding my daughter in my arms that I didn't know she was going to be mine. But God gave her to me, and he helped me to see his love through the lens of loving this little girl that I would do absolutely anything for that I would go any distance, I would go any mile, I would do absolutely anything for this little girl. You see, I had asked God to help me love the way he does. And he showed me this love that was more powerful and more deep and more real than anything I had ever experienced. And I, I met my daughter in that moment. It took us 11 years before she had our last name, but I would do all the years to have her. But what I understood through that was a truth that my mom had told me, my parents had told me all throughout the years. They continually told me how much they loved me. But they always said, as much as we love you, God loves you more. And you see, it was in this moment of understanding the love I had for my daughter that I also understood that God loves me even more than this. I mean, it blows my mind to accept the love that God has for me, not because of anything I did, not because of anything I earned, but because God just so graciously poured it out upon me. He loves me just because he loves me. My daughter didn't do anything to earn my love. She's a little stinker, in fact. She's a cute one. God just loves us. There are a lot of people sitting here today, and I, I would I would propose that there are folks sitting here today who say, yeah, but God can't love me because of all the things that I've done, the guilt that I carry. Shame and guilt will keep you from experiencing the love of God has that he has for you that he so freely gives. What would it look like if you allowed God to love you? If you would accept the love that God already has for you. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You maybe already know Jesus, but you think, I'm not good enough. And this is keeping you from experiencing life to the fullest because God loves you so much. I'm sorry for the hurts that you have. I want to invite you and challenge you to lay those at the feet of Jesus, to surrender that and accept that he truly, deeply loves you. In this verse, it says, there's a new command that I give you. Command. I look at that word and I say, command. Well, what does command mean? Because command, if we look at the word love, can you command love? Well, yeah, you can. Because love is not based on an emotion or a feeling. Love is based on who Christ is. So he says, love the way I do. He's saying, I'm telling you to make a choice to do as I have done. It's not based on a feeling, and that's why you can love your enemies, as Jesus says, to even love your enemies. He's not telling you to like your enemies. You don't have to like 
even the person that you're doing something for because it's not based on if they can earn it. God just says, love as I have loved you. I like to think of this as an opportunity that we get to be Jesus to somebody. He invites us into the opportunity to be Jesus with somebody. And I like to say opportunity versus obligation because obligation just sounds kind of yucky, right? But the reality is it's an opportunity and an obligation because Jesus says, this is the command that I give you to love others the way I have loved you. That means I have to make a choice to do what Jesus did. I have to make a decision to carry out the way I I see Jesus throughout my scripture, to carry out and carry his love to somebody else. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to take my time. But this ahava love that Jesus is talking about says, put yourself aside. Put aside the things that are going on in your life. Go away from your mundane and let an interruption come in that you would love somebody because when you love somebody and put yourself aside, kingdom work is happening there. And we get to be a part of what God is doing in the world when we make the choice to love others. Come on. It is an opportunity to bring Jesus in a tangible way to people like that lady was with me. Is there a tangible way that you need to take Jesus to somebody in this week? You have the opportunity and you have the obligation. I challenge you to not let your busyness or whatever it is that you have going on from preventing this person to experience the love of Jesus. That looks like all kinds of different things. It's an action, we have to live it out. Sometimes it's meeting physical needs. And this is the Jesus that I see in scripture and that I've experienced in my life, that Jesus always meets physical needs as well as spiritual needs. When we have somebody come to us in Benin and they're talking about how they're hungry and they haven't eaten yet today because that's the reality of things. And I say, oh, let me pray with you. Jesus loves you, let's pray. And I send them away, what does that do? But if I fill their stomach, they are going to be able to experience the love that Jesus has for them. I can't truly love them and not also meet their physical need. It's important to do both because I see Jesus also doing both. He fed people, he healed people, he showed up for people. There was action behind it. First John, First John 3.16. Now I know a lot of you are like, sweet, I know this Bible verse. John 3.16. First John 3.16 says this. First John 3.16 through 18 says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in this person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in action and in truth. Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I love that meme that says, I would totally take a bullet for you. Not like in the head or the chest or anything like that, but in the foot for sure. (laughs) Jesus laid down his life literally for us. And he says to do the same for one another. Now, I don't think that we're going to be asked to go and be crucified on a cross like Jesus did for somebody else. But we do get the opportunity and we do have the obligation to lay down the things that are preoccupying us and the the barriers that we have in our way in order that we can show the love of Jesus to somebody else. Would you be willing to lay down your objectives? Would you be willing to lay down the things that you've got going on in your life in order that you can bring the love of Christ to somebody instead? We have an opportunity to give action to the love of Jesus. My sister and I have this thread where we communicate. And this particular thread that we have is all about workouts. And so she'll send me workouts and I send her some workouts and there's all this workouts. And I was like, man, Emily, can you imagine if we actually did these workouts? We would be pretty good shape by now, just saying. 
<sighs> so it's one thing to look at these workouts and watch these workouts, right? But if I don't do them, they're for nothing. We can talk about being Jesus to other people. We could talk about being love to another person. We could talk about choosing to do like Jesus did for somebody else. But if we don't make the decision to actually do it, it just is a workout that's still on Pinterest that had no effect on our life. Is there something that you actually need to do today? Is there an exercise of love that you need to execute? That might look simple. It might be a text message to somebody to say, hey, you were on my mind, I just wanna encourage you. Because like I said, when we love people for Christ, it fortifies the, the other believer as well. We need to strengthen each other. That is loving one another. When I receive text messages from friends to say, hey, I'm thinking about you, I just want you to know you're not alone, I'm praying for you. We received meals from a whole bunch of different people after we had a baby last summer because ain't nobody got time for cooking. And mama hungry. That was an incredible act of love and I felt Jesus in a new way because somebody was meeting a physical need that we had in order to provide a spiritual need and blessing in my heart, in order to continue to lift me up. A friend drove five and a half hours the morning that I was performing my grandmother's funeral just to show up and be there to say, I'm with you. I know this is hard, but I'm with you. I saw Jesus in a new way that day that I'm so grateful for. There's a ministry of showing up. The ministry of just showing up. There's my good friend Moti. You might know her as Mother Teresa. <laughs> Moti. She says, not everybody has to do great things, but everybody can do small things with great love with great love, when we can love somebody in a great way, transformation happens. They get to experience Jesus. A friend of mine recently had her husband in the hospital and he was going through surgery and not a week later he has to go through another life-threatening surgery and she told me, she said, a friend of mine showed up and prayed with me. She said, I went to church when I was younger. I heard about all this Jesus and then I had so many hurts and I was mad at God because I felt like, where are you in all of the junk that's going on in my life? I know that you're there, but you're all holier than thou and you're not coming down here to me. And she said when her friend came and prayed for her, she said it was the first time at 52 years old that I felt Jesus in a tangible way. It's the ministry of showing up. You might know Pastor Sheila who comes up here, but to me, she's Shishi. She's my friend. We ran together for years and years. And early on in my time in Africa as well, she came as a part of a missions trip and she said, I'm just here to be with Ashley. She said, let people judge me. I don't care, think it's shallow if you want. I'm here to be with my friend because she knew her friend also needed to be encouraged. She knew that I needed the love of Christ. Well, what I didn't know and what she didn't know when she came, that in the time that she came and the time that she chose to show up was going to be one of the worst days of my life. It was going to be one of the worst experiences of my life. I was going to have the greatest loss of children that we had that were taken from us in that time. Jesus did not leave me alone. He was with me spiritually, but I needed him with me physically because I was mad. And he sent me Sheila. She showed up. And I remember Sheila, my friend, doing that, but I remember more than anything that Jesus said, I know what's coming and I got you still. And she responded to what Jesus was putting in her heart and that changed everything in mine. If he's nudging you to do something, if the Holy Spirit is nudging you to show up somewhere, do it. You have an opportunity and a responsibility and an obligation that you can take Jesus to people. Whoo, what a privilege we have. It's awesome. I have uh, the opportunity as well. And part of the ministry that we do here back in December, there was a local clinic in the village of Sakate. That's where we minister in West Africa. Uh, in this village, we have a clinic 
a medical clinic, and one of the nurses from there came to our workers and said, hey, we've got this lady, and she is in real bad shape. We've been trying to help her for about a week, but she's going to need to have an operation in order to save her life. She's got something going on, some kind of infection in her stomach, and she's going to need an operation, can you, but they can't, they can't afford it. Because, of course, you have to pay for everything ahead of time, but they can't afford it, so would you pay for this? And I'm like, oh. You know, it doesn't really fit into our objectives. It's not really fitting into what we do, but is this what Jesus laid before me? Is this a need that she has? And so, you know what we did is we put out the word that, hey, we've got this lady, we've got this situation, and we need this much money for it. Would anybody like to participate in that? And, whoo, man, people did. It was incredible to see that people, including people in this church, gave financially, they gave physically to meet a need of somebody else across the world. Because of that generosity, we were able to get this lady the life-changing, life-saving surgery that she needed, and she is still alive because of it. When John and I were there just a couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to, to meet with her. My husband is a nurse, and so he takes care of a lot of the medical stuff, and we had the opportunity to meet with her. And um, through that, we also understood that she's of the Islamic faith because we live in a primarily Muslim community. So she's of Islamic faith, and we were, we were getting to talk with her and share with her, and my husband was looking at her incision, and as he was examining her incision, I also noticed that she had a scar from a C-section. So I said, oh, you have a child. Where is this child? Well, this child is already dead. Because last summer, the child had fell ill, but they didn't have the finances to take the child to the hospital in order for him to receive healing. Oh, my heart just sank in the desperation that this woman must have felt, the hopelessness that she had in her life, that not only had she lost her son, but her life was at risk as well. She really was hopeless. What is there to fight for anymore? We made sure that she had all the nutrition that she needed. We made sure that she was getting the medication that she needed. And after we had returned back here, I asked one of my local workers, I said, hey, you need to go and check on this person. It was stirring in my heart. The Lord had just kind of brought it to my mind. We need to go and check on this, on this gal. And so I asked Elizabeth to go check on her. And Elizabeth went and checked on her. And she was laying on the mat just about skin and bones. She'd given up. It was just too much for her. And the problem was because there was not anybody there to take care of her. Even though her mom was there, they didn't have uh, what they needed. They really didn't have the courage to continue to move forward. What was there left to live for? I said, Elizabeth, I need you to go every day and check on this gal. I need you to encourage her because if not, I know that she is just going to die. And I feel like we have a responsibility there. Elizabeth is seven months pregnant. She has two children that she has already taken care of because they're on her own because her husband works in a different town. And so she is just at her limit. But she gets on the back of a motorcycle every single morning so that she can go and check on this lady. And she prayed with her every day and she encouraged her. And this lady now has gone to church to receive prayer and she wants to know about Jesus because the love of showing up of Elizabeth. Oh my goodness. And it started with people like you meeting a physical need that later addressed a spiritual need. Jesus met the physical and the spiritual together. Had she not gone and prayed with her daily, had she not gone to encourage her daily, had she not gone and continued to show up, this lady was probably going to be dead and she would have gone without knowing Jesus. The love of Jesus. Do you need to show up for somebody? Is there somebody you need to show up for? in your life. I'm learning love in new ways. As she prayed for her, that was one of the greatest ways of love. Listen, praying for our friends and praying for someone else is one of the greatest acts of love that we can share with one another. Some of the hardest times that I was going through in recent years, I had a group of friends who ganged together and started a group to start praying for me behind my back. How dare them? They were praying for me behind my back. You know what? It changed something. When I found out too after 
These prayers had been answered and I found out that they were praying for me behind my back. That did something for me too. That fortified me in the Lord and the power of my friends praying for me. It reminded me of the story when, when uh, in, in the scriptures, there was a man who was paralyzed in order for him to receive healing, he needed to get to Jesus. But Jesus was inside of a house and there was a large crowd in there with him. And this house was so jammed packed that they could not get in to take their friend who was paralyzed to put him before Jesus so he could receive healing. You know what those friends did? They got on top of that house and they tore open the roof and they lowered their friend down to Jesus. Woo! Get you some friends like that, y'all. When my friends were praying for me, that's what they were doing for me. They said, I will stop at nothing to make sure that you get to Jesus, that you receive the healing that you need. I was so grateful for that, and I felt Jesus loving me in that. Do you all have friends who are praying for you behind your back? You need those friends, and you know what? If you don't have those friends, be those friends. Pray for somebody behind their back. That is such an incredible way to love somebody. It's the privilege of getting to take them to Jesus in that way. Jesus is the most important. My nine-year-old uh, son, his name's Kojo. And uh, you know that when the war with Israel was happening, we start seeing this and we're hearing it on our television. And uh, my son is observing that because we just have one TV you know, there in the family room and he's observing this war happening. And he's questioning what's going on and these people are dying. And, but dad, is that the same Israel that we read about in the Action Bible with the Israelites and God's people and all this? And that was a lot to try and explain to our nine-year-old. But my husband did, he explained it to him and he shared with him, yes, and that Jesus, is the one who came to save everyone. But we have to accept Jesus and that he saved us in order to live with him after death. And he said, but what about David? You see, David is his friend who doesn't know Jesus. And in that moment, I was profoundly struck by my nine-year-old being so concerned of his friend who didn't know Jesus and had an urgency to say, he needs to go too. He needs to know Jesus. And you know what? It's my responsibility to take Jesus to those around me. We are Jesus in this world. When he asked about his friend, that changed something in my heart to say, oh my gosh, yes. If we really love our friends, if we really love the people that are in our lives, we will make sure that they know Jesus, not only for eternity, but for here in this life and this kingdom now. Because living with Jesus in our life is the most incredible journey and the most incredible blessing that we could ever have. Living with Jesus, the love story of Jesus is the greatest love story ever told. So I'm wondering, what story is your life telling? What story is your life telling? Is it one of the love of Jesus? Or are we still missing that piece? We get to bring the love of Jesus and we're commanded to do so. I wanna ask my Shishi if she'll come up here with me because I wanna pray with you today because I think that all of us might fall into one of three categories. Either one, we have yet to accept Jesus in our life, and we want to offer the, you the opportunity to accept Jesus in your life. Number two, you know who Jesus is, and you hear that God loves you, but there's a difference between knowing God loves you and letting God love you. I want to pray with you if you need healing and you need to let God love you, that you would surrender that in this day. And finally, the rest of us, that we would pray a dangerous prayer. Lord, would you help me to love people the way you do? Because I can't do it on my own. But with your power, we can be Jesus in this world. Shishi, would you stand with us, please? 
We want to invite you to accept Christ as your Savior. If you have never prayed a prayer, then we want you to pray this prayer out loud. I'll say some words. It'll be different than the one we usually say, but it'll still be a prayer for you to accept Christ. And everyone's going to say it as well out loud as a confirmation of their own faith, but also to come alongside. And let's pray this prayer today. Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe in you. I trust you to love me. I trust you to love me. Please forgive my sins. Please forgive my sins. Amen. 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 If you are in the second group of people, I want to invite you, if you need healing, if you need to let God love you, if you need to allow the love of God to truly consume your life and you can lay down the hurts, you can lay down the shame, you can lay down the guilt before Jesus, I would like to ask you if you're willing, be bold enough to raise your hand and say, that's me and I need this healing, and I want this healing. And I ask that those of you who are around the people with their hands up, that you would love them enough to gather around and pray for them. If you just walk over and just put your hand on somebody or just reach out beside somebody who you are, and you can uh, just put your hand on somebody just close to you. Father God, I pray over these people. I pray over the hurts that we have. I pray over the shame that we carry. I pray over the guilt that the enemy wants to convict us of. But Father God, with you, we can experience your love and fullness because you've made the ultimate sacrifice. Nothing we can do earns it. And you love us fully and completely. I ask that you bring healing over people and the ways that they've been hurt. That you bring your Holy Spirit and fullness over them and in their life, that they would receive you and understand your love in a transforming and a powerful way. That Today they walk out of here as new people, transformed by the love that you have for them. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The rest of us, I want to challenge you in this Valentine's Day that when you look at the word love, you're not thinking of Cupid, but you're thinking of Jesus. Would you pray a dangerous prayer with me today that we would love the way Jesus does and be able to transform and be hope to our community because of that love. Father God, we pray over all of your people here and joining us online and in Ironton, Father God. We ask and we pray boldly, Lord, that you would help us to see people the way you do, that we would love people the way you do because they don't need to experience what we have the ability to do, but they need to experience the love that you have for them. God, give us the courage, give us the strength that we would go out and set our si- ourselves aside to meet the needs of other people because of your love and that they would not see us, but they would see you and have a new hope because of it. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen.